This is what we've been needing. Well, at least it should be. Obviously, we need to wait for the final performance metrics in the real world, but this GTX 2080 Ti should provide the horsepower we need to power 4K ultrawides. So the three new GPUs, which obviously you'll all know about by now, are the RTX 2070, 2080, and 2080 Ti from NVIDIA. The RTX name change up being in reference to the new ray tracing lighting technology supported with its dedicated new hardware, making these cards unique in more ways than the GTX cards of old. The big numbers people are going to be shouting about are things like the 14 gigabytes of GDR6 buffers in the 2080 Ti over the 1080 Ti's already significant 11 gigabytes of GDR5X. But remember, these numbers all don't mean huge amounts by themselves. It's the overall updates, not pure increases in memory size, that lead to the significant performance boosts. But yes, the jumping out specs do look beautiful. I'm really focused on the 2080 Ti here because it's the card that takes over the highest end of top tier gaming, the 1080 Ti, and that card was the first to truly provide the perfect 30 for 40 by 1440 gaming experience. You can play on high to ultra settings on all AAA games, with very few exceptions, those being notably poorly optimized titles. The 2070 and 2080 are still going to be great cards, I'm sure, but other than their specific ray tracing support, even the 2080 won't be toppling the 1080 Ti in pure power terms. That said, they might prove to be great cards for taking over 30 for 40 by 1440 gaming for certain gamers where the 1080 Ti was previously the only option, providing a lower cost possibility. But yes, most importantly, the 2080 Ti might actually provide a platform for ultra-wide 4K gaming at 60fps high settings. Currently, this is simply not possible. Even 16x9 4K gaming at ultra settings is not possible on a GTX 1080 Ti, regardless of what some people might think. The majority of AAA games simply can't run that resolution with those graphics settings and maintain over 60fps at all times. This new card, certainly I don't doubt, will change that, and it should mean that we can close that significant performance gap between 16x9 4K and true ultrawide 4K, because that performance gap is far greater than 2560x1440 to 3440x1440. Now, what I can't deny is that whilst the 2080 Ti is going to be bloody epic, I do wonder if it's going to be sitting in a weird spot for us ultra-wide gamers, because as we lack an ultra-wide 4K monitor yet, or even a proper HDR-supported one yet, this card feels like it's going to sit at a point where we can easily run ultra-everything settings at over 100fps at all times at 3440x1440. It might feel like you're potentially wasting power because we don't have the increased resolution to push it to its limits, in a way not getting the full benefit you've paid for. It's like if you bought a 1080 Ti for 30 for 40 by 1440 but only have a 60Hz monitor, you've really spent money on a card that you're not getting the most out of because that card can push most things above 60 easily. Now, a good response to this is, well, just shoot for 30 for 40 by 1440 at far higher frame rates, and honestly, I think that's good enough. Higher frame rates are easily the most overlooked benefit, and provide a gaming experience far in excess of standard 60. Breaking into that 140 plus FPS bracket would be quite something for a gorgeous game. Now talking of graphics, the ray tracing feature really is of serious interest to myself, as lighting is a key part to making a game world absolutely gorgeous. What I'm very curious to see though is seeing as the ray tracing component is a separate physical piece in the GPU, hence the RTX name, will it mean saving some computational power in the rest of the GPU for other graphical tasks that would normally have to be spent computing lighting? With 21 titles named to support the technology, I can't wait to try it out for myself. YouTube compression means we are way past the days of ultra settings videos truly showing the awesomeness of such finer details. You need to experience that sort of thing in person, and I can't wait to do just that. A few bits of interest to some of you, if you're on a 1080 Ti already, you don't need to worry about wattage increases. The 2080 Ti will maintain the 250 watt draw, thankfully. Also, for those looking to buy stock Nvidia cards, there has been quite a noticeable design change to the chassis, bringing a more rectangular design. The first real change in a very, very long time. So yes, I'm going to be jumping ship to the 2080 Ti as soon as possible, around its release on the 20th of September, so not long to wait for it at all. It's also the perfect example of the fantastic work AMD have done at bringing the competition back to the market, as Nvidia are no longer holding back the release date of the Ti card, something they've done for years.
Cost-wise, the 2070 remains a roughly mid 550 to 600 pound card, with the 2080 looking at 750 to 800 pounds, and the 2080 Ti up just over the 1,000 pound mark. That's a huge price tag without doubt, and will scare a lot of people off. Even the 2070 is no real budget card. Of course, the prices, like I've said, are going to be in a range when we get the third-party alternatives popping up providing more expensive versions with added benefits like increased cooling abilities and such, but that's all to be waited on for a while. I'm certainly more interested in buying a third-party version over a stock NVIDIA card as that's something I've always done. And the good news for those purchasing GPUs in general anyway on a budget is all the 10 series cards will drop in price nicely. So let me know what you guys think of this new lineup. How many of you are going to be grabbing one of these, and if so, which one? I know my audience has a lot of people ready to pump the money into the 2080 Ti to match their equally expensive ultra-wide monitors, so I'm excited to see how you all fare with the new Extreme Power. Let us know down in the comments.